I'm from uh, Machine Zone. Machine Zone is uh, doing several wonderful things with real time, and one of the um, one of the technical uh, underpinnings is the WebSocket-based uh, uh, real time messaging protocol. So to remind you, the WebSocket is a uh, persistent layer on top of TCP, which is initiated by doing an HTTP request with some special headers, and the response indicates whether all of the uh, systems between the client and the server support the WebSocket. Uh, if uh, the response goes through uh, all right, then uh, the bidirectional connection is established, and then uh, two systems can exchange messages uh, in both directions uh, simultaneously with a little, very little overhead, and uh, with a number of features that uh, can be added on top, including custom application-specific features uh, like uh, um, some additional compression protocols uh, and uh, support for um, many applica application-specific stuffs. Um, the small caveat is that not all proxies have been upgraded in the world, so the secure uh, web sockets have a better chance to penetrate all of the firewalls. So. For uh, some of you who never tried WebSockets, if you are trying to deploy an application, uh, it's better to start with WebSockets, which is essentially like HTTPS, uh, something over SSL layer. Uh, Machine Zone, a couple of words. Uh, the flagship products are two games, which are highly, very successful. They are very uh, dynamic and real time in terms of uh, having a very short uh, time between the user action and the feedback, which may result in a change of game design elements and uh, suggestion of different things to purchase. And this real-time uh, real feedback or shortening the real-time feedback has enabled us to reach the first places in uh, uh, Apple store by revenue. So we are, we are heavily invested in real time. We know the dollar value of every millisecond shaved. And therefore, we need to be competitive in this space. And we think that uh, this uh, real time um, efficiency is a competitive asset. The real time here is uh, something that works uh, across the uh, internet scale of timing, meaning milliseconds or dozens of milliseconds, not necessarily the hard versus soft real time distinctions that were introduced by embedded systems engineer and engineers, and not something that uh, we necessarily have to adhere to. Uh, the challenges that we have developing the uh, significant scale system or large scale systems is, uh, first of all, we have to support hundreds of millions of global users and send millions or actually hundreds of millions events to them for uh, different things, for click streams, for user-to-user uh, -user messages, for chats, for translations. And uh, if we are talking about web sockets, the Existing TCP level law testing tools do not work well with WebSockets because you need to do this HTTP based handshake first, so you cannot really uh, get the uh, standard TCP testing tool and try to use it against the WebSocket API. Uh, because of that, we developed a couple of uh, benchmarking slash um, law generator tools, which, is, which are TCP Kali a command line utility for an individual developer, and MZBench, which is a distributed server-based uh, thing. It can be used on a single computer, but typically you would install it somewhere, <coughs> such as on AWS, and uh, you would drive a number of, uh, any number actually, of uh, individual uh, testing nodes and drive the traffic from all of those dozens or hundreds of nodes into the specified destination. The MZ Bench was described in that particular talk by Vipav. Uh, you can, uh, I'll share the presentation. You will be able to watch it if you want. But this presentation is about TCP Kali. 
TCP Kali supports very large scale persistence on a single box. Whatever we, uh, persistence has in persistent connections and multiple simult simultaneous connections. The large scale in, on a single box would mean that we can uh, quickly open millions of connections from a single box or terminate millions of connections on a single box. It is a little bit non-trivial things, and I will just describe how TCP Kali helps to develop those kind of large-scale systems. Uh, TCP Kali has to be extremely fast in order not to introduce additional latency in no, in, and in order not to interfere with the operation of the software that it's trying to test. The main uh, way we are using it is uh, we, use, uh, we, we set up software on the local host and we drive the traffic for local host. This is for development, development purposes. And then for many additional benchmark, we do the proper setup where we would drive traffic from other machines to verify our findings. And typically, you would have wildly different uh, problems, and you, you, you will see wildly different performance. But local host testing is still useful to figure out the profile information, for example, and your bottlenecks in the code, whether the bottleneck is in, is in parsing or application-specific code. Uh, TCP Kali tries to be developer-friendly. It's open source. And if you have Mac, you can quickly install it using brew install TCP Kali right now. When we develop large-scale systems, we have several categories of challenges. And we need to solve them with appropriate tooling. The stress testing as a, an activity, as something that you uh, do if you do that, tends to break things. It uh, destroys your systems if they were not uh, tested before. So if you haven't tested uh, your software using stress test tools, you are in for a surprise if you do it the first time. It will break. Many clients, as in multiple clients, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of millions of clients accessing your system simultaneously will break things. Slow clients, which do not consume information as fast as you're trying to send to them, will break things in your software. Some WebSocket um, shenanigans like framing options, combinations of different frames, ordering of frames, and incomplete frames will break things. So this is uh, a borderline security thing that you can do with uh, TCP Kali, though TCP Kali was not designed for security specifically. And while you are doing development and testing, you need detailed visibility into what's going on, meaning that you have to uh, be able to drive the tools and tool in a way to discover the failure and uh, maybe uh, um, try to uh, get some information out of it to help you to debug. So I will describe how to, to use TCP Kali to address all of those categories of problems. The first is stress testing. The uh, genius idea is to repeat message many times as fast as possible. The first line here specifies, suggests that uh, we are using WebSockets to connect to the specified IP address and port, and we are repeating my data in separate WebSocket frames over and over. Um, if uh, we do not specify WebSockets, TCP Kali can be used as a straight uh, vanilla TCP uh, load testing tool. Uh, here we are using minus D, which means dump. Uh, the dump allows you to discover what we are actually sending, uh, what we are writing into the socket, and what is getting received from the socket in a formatted way. way. Uh, in this case, we are combining them, and actually uh, it doesn't make sense to ask TCP Kali to uh, drive a lot of traffic and dump it to the screen if we are not specifying a rate, because uh, the default rate is as fast as possible, and your screen will be filled with uh, some my, my data things. Um, I will show everything to you how it works. And uh, TCP Kali can work as in a server mode and in a client mode. And the last line shows how to test itself. So it opens this listening socket, it opens the uh, active socket connects them together and tries to send as much traffic as possible, consisting of Z's. Minus M means message. Um, as promised in the description of this talk, I will show you how to break Node.js. This is the um, 
this is the description of what I'm going to do. I'll grab the code from a random article describing how to set up a simple WebSocket server using Node.js. And I will run this server, and I will drive some traffic into that, and we will see what happens. It will take maybe a, a couple of minutes to demonstrate that. It's not that long. So here we see how system behaves. Here I will open up the node. Everyone sees that? Okay, so what we have is a, a short Node.js script which uh, just echoes whatever it gets using WebSockets. Um, the node version is 6.4.0. I'm running it up and it listens apparently. And then I am driving some traffic to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm sending these individual Z characters, each one in, each, in its own uh, WebSocket frame, to the server. the right um, ah okay okay so what you see is that how typically sends messages into the uh, node.js script and then I'll show what it actually sends it sends frames with a specific WebSocket masking, and it, uh, the, 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 um, the script, the Node.js script, responds with the, these back. So let's uh, do something a little bit more challenging. We would not print anything on the screen in the Node.js script, and then we would do the same. So we are still sending, we are we are receiving something, but we are not printing on the screen. Now, we are removing minus D, and we are removing the speed specification, so it will try to go as fast as possible. What you see over here in the top is amount of memory used by node. So it will crash, hopefully it will not crash my computer, but the reason it will not crash my computer is because TCP Kali stops after 10 seconds by default. So you can specify minus T one hour, for example. Then it might actually crash my computer. But I will not do that. But you, you, can, see, you can see how easily it generates like 500 megabits per second and it goes down. The node uh, memory utilization goes up and you see how it, it will crash the node eventually. So go back to the presentation. Uh, it's pretty much a fundamental problem with Node.js. So I, I could have done something with this web, WebSocket, but I couldn't have solved this problem. So um, now, many clients. The idea is to be able to establish millions of connections to the same IP address or multiple IP addresses. So you can actually specify multiple IP addresses and ports and it will round robin the connections between them. So here I, am, I can specify one million as the number of connections. You cannot or originate more than about 60K connections from a single host. 
in order to support more, more than that, TCP CAL actually grabs all of the aliases, interface aliases from that machine and use, uses them all and uses them uh, as uh, the list of source IPs. So it actually uh, is able to produce more than one million um, messages, uh, one million connections. Uh, the, in this particular case, we are saying that the message rate is going to be mostly idle. We are sending uh, a message every uh, 10 seconds. And the message is a specific web, WebSocket specific ping message. And we are going to do this test for one hour. Uh, this is the same thing, but using the shorter, short options. So this is how you typically write it in the scripts. So it can be understood by the readers. And this is how you typically work uh, yourself uh, in the command line. line. And uh, the... Uh, I've tried it with multiple millions, like six millions on a single host. The problem is that Amazon allows you eight LSS, and uh, if I do it in my lab, I can use hundreds and hundreds of LSS if I have large enough IP space. I did that for millions, it, it works. Uh, it eventually hits many, many limitations in the kernel, but uh, the stock Linux kernel can do a, a few millions if you do a couple of Cisco uh, Cisco tails, right? And let me show you uh, how TCP Kali handles millions of connections. Handles as in suggest things to uh, to uh, um, modify. So let me walk you through. I've tried to create one million connections to the local host, and it says that the open files limit is too low. It suggests changing the file maxis control. The open file limit, as in uh, ulimit, is too low as well, and you can use min uh, ulimit minus n. Uh, then there is local port range, which is a limitation. Then the time weight probably will hit you. Then the IP filter, which is most non-trivial thing, is something that will, will prevent you going higher than about 60K. Uh, or it, it, it will be very slow if you go above that. So those, those things, if you address them and you know, change all of those things one by one, it will allow you to um, create those many connections. Typically, tools don't do that, so people assume that it's kind of either very hard or impossible, but if you do those things, it will, it will trivially uh, work. By the way, a, a, little, um, a little experiment I can do here is, uh, here is a demonstration of how TCP Kali works with itself. So right now, it is doing 23 gigabits per second on a single core inside a VM. So if I do two connections, because my air has two cores, it will do some different number. OK. OK, so if I, depending how, how it got scheduled among cores, uh, you can see uh, up to twice as much uh, bandwidth. So here we see about 40 gigabits per second on two cores. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, next problem, slow clients. Slow clients are clients which do not consume data as fast as you send to them. So if your application is written incorrectly, it will buffer data in all sorts of buffers. The first buffer limit it will hit is the TCP sending buffer, which is somewhere, somewhere between several uh, hundred, several dozen kilobytes and several hundred kilobytes. And then you will start hitting the application level buffers if you have them. If you have written them incorrectly, you will probably hit some errors. Uh, if you haven't uh, written some kind of DOS protection, then eventually your memory will be exhausted, uh, especially if you're trying that with uh, millions of clients, and your applications will, application will crash. You can specify bandwidth limit for downstream and for upstream 
it's symmetrical. And this way you can, uh, you can try out with slow clients. I, uh, I've read some Google research that uh, tried different open source tools and servers and applications specifically against slow clients. And it turns out that slow clients pretty much break the absolute majority of the open source servers. So it is very important to try your application with slow clients. Now, the next problem is WebSocket framing. The WebSocket framing is peculiar. You can send um, pretty much arbitrary amount of data inside a single socket frame. Uh, so to support testing that, TCP color supports including files, and those angle brackets are verbatim. You actually type them in. Uh, and then you, you send a, a binary frame. You, in, here you send a binary frame which contains all of this file. And obviously you can send something like a several gigabytes file uh, to the uh, server and see how it copes. Uh, then the other peculiar thing about uh, WebSocket is that it has uh, text and binary fra frames, but then those frames can be incomplete and then those frames are followed up with continuation frames. So what you can try is you can create an incomplete frame, then multiple incomplete continuations and see how the server side reassembles them. Uh, we actually hit uh, a couple of interesting problems when we first tried to do that because we thought that we had uh, protection from that, but it turns out that we didn't have good enough protection. Even though we had protection, there was no way to test, so TCP Kyle allowed us to test and find problems in uh, memory, with memory utilization. Um, then, the next one, the next problem is developer visibility. We have d different types of dumps. We, ha we can dump all of the data which comes into all connections, comes out of those connections, uh, dump data which comes into any random single connection and goes out of that, and minus D is LAS2 minus, minus dump 1. Uh, something that I will uh, probably um, not be able to describe is latency related options which allow you to use um, histograms, it, it, internally it uses histograms to figure out 99 percentile and 99.5 and pretty much you can specify it in the command line what kind of percentile latencies you need and it computes them and it shows you those percentile latencies uh, and this way you can check whether your code um, is uh, consistent with your SLA, for example. And STATSD, finally, is something that allows long-term storage and preservation of uh, TCP Kali um, experience. Essentially, if you are doing an hour-long test, all of those parameters, input, out, outputs, and uh, latencies, and whatnot, gets exported into STATSD, which is a typically a local daemon, and uh, then, if you use something like a data dog, you can see it on the graphs, and uh, you might see very interesting things like the periodic behavior, like every 10 minutes this goes down, then it goes up, and then you can do something about it. So it's not something, typically is not only a tool which can give you an aggregate statistics, it, it can actually gi gives you that statistic as it goes every uh, several times a second uh, using command line and that's the expert. So um, I had this slide just in case. Here is an example of the full WebSocket communication. So we say that we will be sending these Z characters to uh, this AP address for one-tenth of a second. And first it creates a GET request waits for the HTTP response and then starts sending those Zs. And since we are, we are short-circuiting it to itself, it doesn't reply anything, so we're just sending them. So it shows how it uh, highlights what is getting sent and how many bytes we are writing to the uh, 
kernel to the socket and what we are actually receiving from the kernel. And then it reports something like uh, bandwidth per single channel, aggregate bandwidth, packet rates, estimates, uh, total amount of data sent, test duration, and so on and so forth. There are several additional options available when you enable latency measurements. And uh, there is also a, a several levels of verbosity that you can add in order to uh, show more. TCP Kali is not a security testing tool. I heard that Burp suit is very good. We have a, spe a special uh, security team that uses a multitude of tools to test our security, but TCP Kali is not one of them. Uh, the distributed testing can be done with multiple TCP Kali's, but MZ Bench is much better and UI is much better for distributed testing. It aggregates everything and presents using web UI. TCP Kali is a command line utility. Uh, Scenario-based testing is uh, obviously not supported because the goal for TCP Cal is to be extremely fast. And uh, you, can, you can simulate a little bit, of, uh, little bit of variety in your messages, but by using regular expressions as generators of random data. Uh, sources available, documentation is available. Uh, I'm done. Questions? I didn't get that. Could you repeat, please? Like a database query is wrapped and framed in a request and then sent to the server. Can that be? Yes. Yes. So, so when you are, when you are uh, I can actually show you. We have a minute. Uh, what you are doing is you can specify your message, and your message can be whatever. If it's uh, text, for example, a JSON message. You can send that JSON message, and it will be uh, encoded in a frame. If you need to do something prior to sending this message repeatedly, you can do something like minus one. And then this message will be sent once, and then multiple messages of this kind will be sent. Uh, and obviously, you can use a database query there. You can insert it there. You can do something like HTTP uh, get slash full bar HTTP 1.1 RN RN to simulate HTTP. So it will work and it's explicitly supported. Um, and then, um, for example, let's try it with google.com. Do I have internet? Probably I do. What? Uh, minus D. Okay, so here we see that we we have requ requested the full dot bar and Google re replied with some content. So you can use that to access databases which are not specifically uh, which do not have very uh, non-standard authentication or uh, that are uh, only available through SSL. This because it doesn't support SSL right now. MZBench is also open source and it's also publicly available. Oh, so it's open source, but it's not based on, it's not based on No. No, uh, those tools uh, have been written pretty much simultaneously and uh, are getting uh, evolved simultaneously in slightly different directions. And both tools are heavily used in uh, MZ to develop RC platform. That's it, thank you.
Testing. I'm sure it's good. All right. All right. All right. Next up, we have Devin Abbott, and we have Mary Abbott about Mary Abbott Just a quick show of hands. How many of you guys are front end engineers? Anyone front end? Okay. What about mobile engineers? Hmm. Back end engineers? Okay, so we've got back end engineers. Well, what if you wanted to make a mobile app <laughs> or a front end? Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about React Native, which is this really cool new technology from Facebook. It's open source. And if you've ever even attempted to make a mobile app, you'll know that it's really difficult and really time consuming. And so React Native from Facebook aims to solve some of that. And the general solution is by letting you write JavaScript, which then executes native Objective-C and native Java API calls. So that's sort of React Native in a nutshell. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what you can do with React Native, what makes it so cool, and some of the tools that you can use to make that happen. Uh, so my name's Devin, Devin Abbott, and I create a company called Deco Software, and we make tools around React Native. So I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the cool developer tool stuff we're doing and what it looks like when you build an app. So we make an IDE. And an IDE enables developers to build higher quality apps faster. And we do this by essentially taking all these times when you're sort of running in circles. Um, think about like setting up your environment in React Native. There's a lot of that um, boilerplate for components, for actions, for network calls, for all this stuff. Uh, taking a, trying to implement a common UX pattern like, I don't know, a nav bar or a contacts list, whatever, that definitely already exists in thousands of apps in the App Store, but yet somehow you have to write it custom because the open source one just doesn't quite fit in your app, right? So we're trying to take all these rough spots and smooth out the development process, make it really fast and easy. And so there are three big ideas that we focus on in our tools. The first one is components. This idea that components, uh, these reusable bundles of code, should be fully supported by your tools. They should be easy to create, easy to search, easy to update, and easy to share. The second thing that we want to do is help you scaffold your app. What we mean by that is a lot of stuff right now you, you write from scratch. You start with a blank canvas and you build up from there. What if you could start like what if you could get to 80% of your app in a single day and then just iterate on the custom parts, the parts that make your app special? And the last thing is previewing. It's notoriously painful to build for iOS and Android. It can take minutes before you see a change. And React Native, along with better developer tools, can let you send a preview to your phone instantly. And when you change code, it updates immediately. So the first thing I want to talk about is components. Uh, components. We, we often think of in terms of coding or like engineering components, classes, etc. But I mean more like UX components, like grids, lists, video players, photo galleries, contacts lists. And when you build UI, you often re-implement these things, which you see in thousands of apps. And what we really want to do is say, if I want a grid of videos, I should be able to take an off-the-shelf grid put in a video component, and that should be it. I shouldn't have to write any custom code for that. Or if I want, say, a hamburger menu that opens up to a contacts list, like in Facebook or something. These are just common UX patterns, so I shouldn't have to write any code for that either. Now, of course, these off-the-shelf components won't work for everything. I'll still want to be able to sort of zoom in on one, uh, customize it, configure it, fork it, and make it look like my designs or give it my correct data set. And then I pop it back into my app. The idea is still being that I write very little custom code, and it's more configuration and tweaking. Then I can say, I want to identify the important parts of my component and share it with others. Maybe I made like the material design, like you know, for Android, the material design contacts list. And I want to share that with another team or with the world. My tooling should help me sort of do that, identify the important parts, and make it so that if someone searches for, say, a contacts list, they see my component as one of a bunch of jumping off points. 
The second thing we want to help you do, oh, I forgot my GIF. It shouldn't be like this, where when you want to insert a component, you basically have to rip open your entire app and just copy and paste the whole thing and start changing stuff. It should just work. So next thing is scaffolding. Let me paint a picture in your mind. Let's say I'm building an iOS app today. Uh, I'm building a new app. It is a messaging app, and it has a really cool feature. I can send pixel art to my friends, and they can send pixel art back to me, and it's going to be amazing. Everyone's going to love it. And so uh, the way the development process might work for me right now is week zero, I start blank, empty canvas, nothing. And the first thing I'll probably do, take the first week to sort of stub out my data, my core classes, and my basic layout. Uh, I normally start with colors like CSS, red, green, and blue. If you've written CSS, you'll know how easy it is to make something ugly by using the defaults. Uh, so we're not at a point where we could show this to anyone, of course. Week two, I'd probably you do the detailed UI work. Um, week three, I'd, I'd make it actually look nice. Uh, so at this point, I can start showing it to people. And you know, there's like the core messaging app I'm trying to build. And then week four, I get to do the really cool feature, which is like this pixel art sharing and creation and all that. And so this is pretty reasonable average development cycle for something like this. But I see two problems with it. The first one is, it took me 75% of my time to build just the common messaging app features, which I really wasn't trying to innovate on at all. And I only spent, say, 25% of my time building the cool pixel art sharing, which is the whole reason why my app exists. So that seems sort of backwards to me. And then the second thing is, it took me a whole month to do this. And that's bad for the, the main reason that, for something like this, you need to be testing with real users in real situations, because we often find that our, our users use our apps differently than we imagined. And their way of using our apps might be better, it might be more efficient, but we need to get in their hands to know that. So OK, let's, let's rewind this app I'm building back to week zero. Wouldn't it be great if even on the first day, I could have sort of a scaffolded version? What I mean by that is I can just pop in the core messaging app that I need that I'm not trying to innovate on at all, and I can tweak it from there so that, OK, maybe it doesn't use my data, but maybe it uses Firebase or something. And maybe it doesn't quite match my designs, but I can always iterate on that later. The important thing is I get to focus then the rest of the week on my really cool custom feature. And that lets me get this thing in the hands of users much, much faster. And so the last thing I'm going to do is a little demo. and this is sort of on the topic of previewing about seeing your changes in real time. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm going to build the main screen for the Uber app in five minutes. This is fun. Uh, so I have a screenshot of Uber right here so you can see what we're building. And then mine will look like this. Um, it'll be called Uber. And I'm going to do this in the developer tool I write called Deco IDE. It's an IDE for React Native. It's packaged in Electron, which is a desktop packagement system for running a website as a desktop app, which is awesome. It's written in React. And uh, over here on the left, I have the files in my project. In the center, I have some boilerplate for this Uber app, pretty standard stuff. And on the right, I have the property inspector. And this is sort of a a demo version of our product that it will illustrate some really cool stuff you can do with React Native. I'm going to show you the app in the iOS simulator over here. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually not going to write any code at all. I'm going to insert an open source component. And I'm going to do this with a built-in feature that lets me search through an open source collection of these things. So I'm going to say Command I to insert. And I want a map. So I'm going to search for a map and hit Enter. And now, I have a map. And next, I want a location pin. So you'll see, location pin appears. And on the right, I have the properties of these components that I'm searching and inserting. So I can say, I want my location pin to say set location. And I want it to be black. And it's looking a little more like Uber already. Next, uh, I'm going to write just one thing. You know, 
right of view. And now I'm going to insert a location search box. I'm going to add a title bar above that. And below both of these, I'm going to add a toggle button. And then I'm just going to tweak a couple of these so it looks a little more like Uber. Remember the exact color at the moment. Show this label. Uh, change the title to Uber. And I'll change my toggle button, which is a little bit off screen, but add some border, add border radius, and a padding. So, okay, it's looking like Uber, but it doesn't really have any functionality yet. So I'm just going to add one little bit of functionality, which is uh, I'm going to hook up the map to the search box. So when I move around the map, then the search. Um, the location will change. So here you can see this sort of scaffolding for this map has a callback ready for me. So I can say I want to add the latitude and longitude of um, the map into this component state. And now this is going to throw an error for just a sec because it's updating in real time. But when I'm done, I'm now feeding the latitude and longitude into the search box. <coughs> So I have a little bit of functionality already, which is pretty cool because I just built basically the entire launch screen of the Uber app in like five minutes. Didn't have to write any code myself, just reuse these existing things. So I'm going to show you guys one more fun demo. One more fun demo where uh, it's not as fun as that. <laughs> uh, it's called Floaty Plane. And it might look familiar to a game you've played uh, called Flappy Bird. I did not write this code. I borrowed it from a friend who writes another React Native developer tool called Exponent. It's super cool. I butchered this code, shoved it in Deco IDE, and now you have Floaty Plane. So uh, I'll just play through so you can get the idea. And this little plane, as I click, I fly around. And if I run into something, I lose. Uh, so if you've ever written a game before, you know how tedious and difficult it is to tweak your game to make it feel just right. So one of the things that React Native is great for is this real-time manipulation of your app. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on leap mode, uh, which makes it so that I can't lose. So you'll see I can pretty much just fly through anything now, which is awesome. Uh, but let's say I want to start adjusting things like the amplitude of the plane. I just tweak that, and suddenly it starts flying higher and lower. Or I can adjust the frequency of the plane, and now it'll start going much faster. I can adjust things like the speed of the game. I can slow it down to find just the right speed. If I get to zero, of course, it stops entirely. Or I can speed it up, and now it's way too fast. I can do other cool things. Let me get it looking somewhat normal again. I can do other cool things like adjust the gap between the pipes, make them really wide so that it's easier to play. I could um, go over to the plane itself here and say, I actually want it to be bigger, maybe three times bigger or four times bigger. I could say, I don't want it to rotate as much. I could say, I want to show the hitbox so I can see where it's colliding with things. Or maybe I want to adjust the pipes themselves. I don't want them as wide. Maybe I want to make them really thin. So objectively, this is probably a much worse game. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. But the idea is you can tweak in real time your game and get it feeling just right. And that's it. So yeah, clap. <laughs> Yeah, so in this demo version, it's pretty primitive where they're sort of specified manually. But what we want to do is basically use static analysis of your code and also let the user add some additional sort of intelligence on top, like if a library author wants to customize it. So we infer most of the properties, but also give you a final review. So uh, in this demo version, they're all just sort of loaded in. What we want to do is a couple things. 
first, we want to have like a global repository of these. And most of them will just come from NPM because they're just regular React Native components. Um, but you might want to add like additional smarts that our ID can pick up on top of that. We want to make it super easy for you to publish directly. So the idea being that as you're working in the ID, you can really easily add to this library that everyone can use. And then the last thing is a lot of companies have their own component collection, um, their own design guide. So we want to make it super easy to load in custom sets. So they come from pretty much everywhere. Uh, we've launched. Uh, we've launched. Uh, it doesn't look, uh, like it doesn't look quite demo, like my demo, but if you, go, if you go to our website, Deco Software, you can download our IDE and try it out. It's Mac only right now, but it's built on Electron, so uh, it shouldn't be too much effort to port. We just have a lot of other stuff to do first. Yep. Can you modify the code to see the result, or is it only the properties and all that? You can modify the code, like when I set the latitude and longitude, and uh, that updated right away. Yep. So make How do we make money? Um, um, we're still, figuring, we're still it figuring it out. But we think that definitely like a developer tool like this, you really can't charge for if you want to gain the kind of adoption you need for it to be really valuable to people. And so right now what we do is companies hire us to customize our tool and to integrate it into their workflow for them. Um, so we just recently did a I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about this, so I'm just not going to. But that's the idea. <laughs> yep. Are there any other tools like this? Um, I guess in a very broad sense, there are a lot of tools. So if you don't want to use React Native in particular, like uh, Xcode with Interface Builder does some really cool stuff that's sort of similar. Uh, it's not quite as real time or exciting, but it's also very cool. Uh, and then. If you want to use React Native, there's uh, another tool called Exponent, which is more for specifically previewing. It doesn't do necessarily the real-time code manipulation stuff, but React Native has some of that built in. And then, depending on platform and framework, there's a lot of other stuff. Yeah, because I saw a talk, I watched it on YouTube, maybe a couple of years ago. I don't know if this was more of a conceptual talk, because I don't remember the name of the product. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but there was, it was a designer guy talking There's this guy, Brett Victor, who does a lot of these talks, which are very, very cool and very conceptual. And so it might have been him. And we draw a lot of our inspiration from him. So that's where we want to go. Great. Thanks a lot, guys.